Janet just introduced. I'm Patricia Allen Coates, and I'm a nutritionist, and I prepare weekly healthier vegan foods for the community every Wednesday. And today, yeah, we're going to talk about that word called squash, but a lot of people don't realize how to prepare squash. So we're going to start off with something easy and fun. I'll have to wait till everyone in the room has a handout so we can all follow along. But one thing we can all take note of is, you know, food preparation or why even eat squash? Does anyone not like squash that's here? Some people just say, don't give me that. I don't like the way it looks. I don't like the way it smells. You know, your kitchen can come, sometimes kind of smell like squash and it's like, Ooh. But why eat squash? Because you know why? It really helps. Pardon? Yes, you're right. And, yes. And what, another thing is, I think for a mere one cup or two cup serving, it's a mere 50 calories. But it's rich in micronutrients such as magnesium. And I think there's you know, a good amount of fiber in there, a couple of grams of fiber, which helps with satiety. So it's going to help you feel fuller for longer. And also importantly, with the, with the squashes and fall and winter squashes, they help keep you healthy with vitamin A sources for the impending winter doom, right? So it's important to eat seasonally based on the reasons that it helps your body's immune system prepare for the upcoming season. So today I want to show you how to, you know, enjoy squash easy, fast, and nutritiously. So does everyone have a handout right now? Fantastic. So here, if you just want to look at the first recipe shown up there, it's pumpkin and polenta party squares. You know, I just thought about this. I thought, yes, we need something that's gluten-free for the gluten-free folks, something that's easy to do. Because you know what? If you're planning for a, a party or it's the holiday time, nobody really has time or the inclination to spend it in the kitchen. And I don't want you spending time in the kitchen. I want you in and out of that kitchen as fast as possible. So here we go. Follow along with me. We're going to have... First start, polenta. Now with the polenta, how many of you have cooked cornmeal polenta before so you're familiar with it? Uh, it's this beautiful, rich American corn and it's just been coarsely ground. And that was another feature I wanted to give you folks today is typically featuring American foods, right? Because why not eat American foods? This is the country we live in. It may not be our native country, but it's a wonderful country. And I got the, I love tea towel. So I'm just one of those tea towel people. And I thought I'd bring along my little United States tea towel, right? So these are the foods of, United, of America, at least part of it, although they're showing all the fun stuff you can do here in America too. So I'll just need this because this might get a little messy on down the road. I'm looking for, if someone could, Pardon me, I just need to ask for my water because I need the water to begin. Thank you. So with that said, going back to the polenta, those of you who may be familiar with it, you just pour the polenta into boiling water. I'm going to table that for just a moment while we're getting that water and see what else we can also speak to with this, with this recipe because what you want to do is just get a base like you would a pizza base. The cornmeal is naturally gluten-free. And it's also a beautiful yellow color, and it's easily digestible. So even for people who might have compromised digestive systems, it's usually pretty well received. It's also a food that you can enjoy either warm, crispy, or at room temperature, right? So if you're having a, an event, you can, it can stay at room temperature safely, you know, in case of any other issues that might come up. Sometimes you've got to have a hot plate. That's not going to work for parties. So just get some food that's easy to prepare nutritious and people find really yummy. So what you got to do is prepare that polenta base. And I think my water's coming up, hopefully. As soon as it does, yay, thank you. Thank you, miss, thank you. Just put it right there. Typically this would continue boiling if we were at home. And one thing that if you can look above, one thing critical to preparing polenta is not just to dump it into a pot of water. Has anyone ever done that? Do you know what happens if you just dump this into the hot water? Oh, man. You don't want to do it because well, yeah, it's going to lump up, and really you just want to pour and stir. Actually, what they have in some European countries where polenta is very popular, such as Italy, for example, they actually have 
machines that pour, that stir automatically for you to prepare your polenta. It's so popular there because stirring can be quite labor intensive if you're doing large quantities. But for the quantity here today, it's easy, it's manageable, and it should cook up in about five minutes. So you just continue stirring. How do you know when your polenta is finished? Anybody know when you know when it's done? It actually starts to pull away from the pan. So if you're stirring, this is not gonna pull away from the pan today because it's not continuing to cook. But what it will do is actually pull away from the pan so you can see the, the bottom of the pan. Yes, sir. I'm just gonna go with this for right now. You have, well, he's asking if I need a hot plate, but I think we have, we have some already prepared, so I think we'll, we'll be okay. Thank you for- She's hot stuff. So. Hot stuff, oh, Harlan. <laughs> So anyway, you just pour, you know what also is good? I don't know whether I include it in here. I say pour, I'm using water for this food demonstration, but if you want an extra rich or flavorful polenta, you can always add it, use it with veggie broth, which is easy to have because when you're actually preparing the squash, and for this demonstration, I believe I use pumpkin and spaghetti squash, I actually prepare an easy way to prepare the squash is to simply place it in a slow cooker. Any of you have a slow cooker or pot, crock pot at home? So you just wash that outside, plunk it in the crock pot, and let it cook, right? And so actually after it cooks, it will, there will be some liquid remaining. You wanna reserve those liquids because they're nutritious, yummy, and help enhance the foods that you're cooking with. So, uh-oh, I went and talked and stopped stirring my polenta. See, even with its hot, it's starting to thicken up, and so it's beautiful. Now, once it would thicken and pull away from the pot, what you'd want to do is pour it into a prepared pan. And then you'd want to just, you know, smooth it on down, pan it on down. Now, the second part of this recipe calls for pouring it into one thing that's critical too. This is an aluminum pan for the purposes of this demonstration. But one thing that's a really good uh, piece of equipment to keep in your kitchen is parchment paper. I don't know if any of you use parchment paper on a regular basis, but unless you really love scrubbing your pots and pans, even a dishwasher because sometimes you can't get that stuff clean, you want to just line your pans. It makes it for easier cleanup. So I would typically pour this into a parchment lined pan. And then for the topping is a delicious, like I said, it's party food, right? You can make it any kind of flavor profile you want. Today I'm using a salsa party because kind of salsa flavor profile. So once again, I wanted to make it easy for you folks. So if we have our, our polenta base, oh, it's, see, it's already thickening, just standing still here using all that polenta. I can go ahead and pour some of this in the pan so we can get the benefit of a visual. And if you have extra polenta, you can always pour it into another pan or you can pour it into some sort of form containing container or if it happens to get too thick on you before you can pour it into any other sort of reserve bowl, you can always heat it back up again in the heater with some more added broth and it will become more of a liquid state. So there you have that beautiful polenta. And then for the toppings, what am I saying here to do? You just want to uh, spread this out since it's already semi-liquid. Well, I think I might just use a little bit of this since it is firming up nicely. Just smooth that out. And then I'm saying mix the pumpkin, which I have, I have some reserve pumpkin right here. I wasn't certain I was going to actually get a food processor, but this is a good thing to have kids do. You know, this is just the prepared pumpkin, like I said, in, in a crock pot, if your pumpkin's small enough. Or if you don't have a crock pot and would like to use your oven, simply wash your pumpkin, place it in the oven and let it cook. It will cook, takes about an hour or so at a 300, 325. And how do you know when a pumpkin is prepared, right? I really wanna encourage you to cook without number one recipes. These are guidelines. And number two, I want you to engage your senses. Now, uh, the second one I would say, you can tell when something is finished or ready to eat by your sense of smell, if it's not compromised. You know, sense of smell, when you can actually smell that food, it tells us a lot, right? It tells you to turn off the oven, turn it off. Number two, you know, it tells us it's ready to eat. So turn it off when you start to smell something. And then number three, visually, your squashes will start to, to develop, especially pumpkin, a certain sheen on the skin, right? 
So once it's developed and gone to that stage, it's ready to eat. But what I do, I merely turn off the oven, I let it cool in that oven as it cools off. It still will continue to cook internally, so it's naturally steaming. It's a healthy way of preparing your pumpkin that's easy. So this is the pumpkin after it's been taken out of the oven. And like I began to say, this is something you could have kids do, right? You don't have to use a dangerous knife. Just get your hands and get it all squishy, right? You can put it in a bag like I'm doing, just kind of squish it up to whatever desired effect you'd like. And you want to put that into your base while your cornmeal is still soft. Or what you might prefer to do, I'm just going to save our ears a little bit by, and not use this uh, food processor. So I'm just going to use some of this pumpkin. The nice texture, I'm leaving it a little chunky because it's nice uh, textural component for the, for the dish. And then I'm just going to spread that out. So what it serves as, people will see this at the party and wonder, really, what in the world? Is, is it cheese? Is it meat? What is it? I say, is it cheese? Because I also prepared for you some spaghetti squash. You guys are probably familiar with spaghetti squash. Once again, put it in your slow cooker, put it in your oven, just whole. It's so much safer that way. So I, love, I did prepare some of the spaghetti squash, which is reminiscent of a dairy product almost. It has a, uh, you know, the stringy type quality, but that as a vegetable, it has a nice little crunchy taste, which I think you'd, you'd benefit from using both squashes. So there you line your base. I'm using a Mexican or South American flavor, so I actually am using one of my favorite sauces. This is a pumpkin salsa, which is, you know, everything's pumpkin flavored nowadays at the stores around you. So you can just pour some of this in. Yes, Mr. Arlen. And there you, you just want to tap this down lightly uh, into the sauce so it doesn't fall off. And there you have it. This can be made a couple of days in advance. You're not going to, you know, you can refrigerate it. And then at the time of your party, you can simply heat it up in the oven for an hour or so, crisp it up. You can cut it into squares, place it again on a parchment lined cookie sheet. It will crisp up a bit and it'll be a tasty little treat. I think, um, what else do I add here? If you wanted to, you could also add some pepitas on here just for extra flavor or profile, or you may benefit from some sort of a sauce, an extra type of like a creamy sauce. I'm just trying to keep it simple and yummy for you today at this demonstration. So with that said, do we have this, the appetizers available? Glory, glory. Okay, so what we're going to have, we've got a new creation at, 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 at this time. But similar, following what we saw here, you will have that with a different sauce. So you'll have the polenta with the yeah, I think, pumpkin squash. Think, uh, squash with this, sauce, with this sauce, with the sauce, right? right All right, so what, what we just learned is, although I prepared many samples of this creation, which you'll get to enjoy, I neglect to add that the samples that you will be um, tasting, especially for Christmas perhaps, to benefit from the red and the green, I place kale because I use kale at my dinners. I make, well, there's kale converts out there, right? People say, oh, not kale, please, no. But you know, I prepared it for you a couple of ways in the, in the demo that you'll be tasting. One is I actually place the chopped kale in the broth so it actually is this golden base with those flecks of green. People enjoy it. It looks pretty, and it's nutritious. What's there not to like? And then for the salsa pumpkin topping, I also prepared some braised kale and put on that as well. Once again, I just want it to look colorful, flavorful, and be nutritious. So that uh, concludes this demo. I think they'll be bringing out the samples. Fantastic. But I'm going to move along unless anyone had any particular questions. But it's kind of hard to ask questions when you haven't tasted it. Yes, please. So we're going to go along now. Which I guess what they will be bringing out is a hybrid of the first recipe and the second recipe, which I'm going to go over with you in detail, which is actually the squash sauce. It's not a very attractive name, I agree, but it's a squash sauce for beans, greens, and grains. The squash sauce is actually, I prepared that with chickpeas. I'm going to show you how to make that. 
it is a standalone dish on its own. Or you can use it, like I say, with braised greens or beans of your choice or any grains. I actually serve this quite a bit of some variation at the Wednesday dinners. It's very popular with all peoples because it's a gluten-free, natural protein um, product. So what are we talking about here? I think as our, our, our menu here says, that we're gonna start with two cups of prepared kabocha, butternut, or pumpkin squash. Well, I believe for the demo on the sauce that you're eating today, I used a hybrid of pumpkin and butternut. Now, this is what I wanna to talk to you folks about a little bit, because I've seen people say, oh, you need to cut up the butternut squash. Really? Why would you wanna cut up a raw butternut squash? You see how, you know, it's kinda of like hard. And it's dangerous. Try doing this. And I would never, no, really try doing this. But at home, you see squashes have round, roundness to them. They are not square. You know, it's going to roll around on you. And then before you know it, you've got to go to the emergency room for repair surgery. And I don't want you to do it. It's not funny. And as I'm speaking of it, when you're in the kitchen with knives, please wear closed-toed shoes, right? I just got to throw that out there. Some people like, I... You know, you don't want the falling knife on the foot e either. So just be cautious you're dealing with um, high moisture content foods, and that's how accidents happen. So not only do people suggest using, like, you know, cut, cut up your squash, and then sometimes they want you to use a peeler. This is a cute little bunny peeler, which also serves, I think, to t remove the ears of corn. But they want you to try and peel this. Like, are you going to, really? If you're preparing food for more than one person, how many, you know, you, nobody's going to stand there trying to peel this thing. You're going to say, forget it. I'm going to buy something out and go to the restaurant. But no, what you want to do with this little beauty that tastes delicious. No, thank you. But maybe I will use one. I should just sample it just so I can talk, talk about what I'm serving here. So you'll see there there's a base. The flavors may not be jiving because they were intended for two separate different dishes, but maybe we'll get through this all together. You know, sometimes that's, you know, that's just the way it is. And mistakes, sometimes you can learn a lot from your mistakes. So anyway, with this little squash baby, all you have to do is rinse it and like I say, just put it in your slow cooker, cover it, and once again, it'll take maybe an hour, hour and a half, I don't know. When you start to smell it, when the skin starts to get a little shiny, that's when you know it's done. So for this particular recipe, I actually started with that butternut squash and a blend of the kabocha squash as well, which I've already pre-measured for you. I, what do I say there? I say you need two cups of prepared squash. Once again, I'm not really giving, I'm not committed to measurements. I, I don't believe we really learn a lot from measurements unless we're on some sort of management program for dietary reasons. But I think you just need to learn. I, I did have a, well, a little bucket here. Oh, well, there we go. So what you do is just put in there what you think is a measurable amount of squash depending on who you are feeding or what your needs are. So you place the squash in your uh, mixer and what else do I, oh sweet potato or carrot. Why sweet potato or carrot? Because once again it's a seasonal food, right? Who would not want to add those little nutrient boosting foods which yeah helps just flavor. Now also I'm not advocating that you got to cook everything from scratch. Sometimes we just don't have the time nor the inclination to do so. However, there are many good products. And I'm not, uh, let me say, how do I say this? Uh, this is not supposed to be a demonstration that I'm, any particular vendor is supporting my advocating for their particular product. If I speak to a product, it is because I enjoy it personally. And um, the company Imagine Soups, it has soups, especially ones low in sodium, vegan soups, which are ready to eat. This is their low sodium sweet potato soup, just for ease of convenience. I'm just going to, I use some of that in this recipe, and it will add the necessary moisture to the squash to help round out the sauce. So you want to add some of the liquid as I have here, and then I said add some veggie broth. I'm going to hold off on adding any of the veggie broth, you know why? I've got some other wet ingredients, and I want to see how this blends up as it is. 
What else do I have? Oh, nutritional yeast. That's everyone's favorite topping on popcorn. Tell me you've all had nutritional yeast. Yay. It's just, it tastes delicious, and it's a deactivated form of yeast. It smells, I don't know, how would you, how would you, it's a cheesy kind of flavor, and it also has a thickening um, component. And you can buy it in large flake. This happens to be a small flake. I think it just comes down to your personal preference. A lot of this um, nutritional yeast you can find is actually fortified, right? So that can help some of your nutritional support needs. So you want to add that nutritional yeast. And, oh, everyone's favorite nut that's not really a nut. It's a droop. But cashew. Now, I'm saying use cashew butter because I had a cashew butter in my pantry. But you can throw in some regular whole cashews. It's not going to matter because... You're going to blend it up any way it goes. So I think I've already pre-measured my cashew butter. And what else do I say? Oh, lemon. I'm in favor of using whole units. I really am reluctant to say, oh, use a half a lemon or one teaspoon of lemon juice because then you're left with this other lemon, which should never go to waste. We live in a wonderful place to enjoy fresh lemons all the time. But I use here a half a lemon. And when you're cutting that half lemon, I don't have one here for you to see, but when you're actually cutting that half lemon, if you want to just merely remove some of the skin of the lemon, but the seeds can remain. Why not? Because, well, it's going in this powerful blender here, right? So it's all good nutrition. And speaking to that point, you know, so what if a little bit of rind or from anything, once it gets into this machine, it's going to be all blended and you'll never know. So I have my cashew butter, my lemon juice. Oh, and then I say to taste. This is where your personality comes into the whole mix. Now here for today's sauce, if you've tasted it, I did add some of the smoked paprika. I also added, this is really something people, it's just a liquid smoke product. So the smoke goes up on the walls, they scrape it off, blend it with some water, and there you have it. It's just natural liquid smoke. A little bit goes a long way. Could any of you taste the liquid smoke? I think it adds a nice component if, if it's not over overdone. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Yeah, great. You're yeah, great. Thank you. Alrighty. So, fantastic. Uh, so he's... All right, well, the siren's going now anyway, so what does it really matter? So anyway, as I was saying, well, the liquid smoke, I think you'll find in a lot of the dishes that it just has a certain nuance to it. And garlic, oh, why not garlic? It's an antifungal, antibacterial, oh, what's the other one? Antiviral, right? So eat that raw garlic at least once a week. Now, this might have a little bit of heating in it, but if you, if you like, you can always press your raw garlic Serve it on pasta. My husband and I, we enjoy that on a weekly basis on the same day so we don't smell each other out of the house. And what it does, it just has a certain way of keeping your body healthy. So always add the garlic. But I, oddly enough, I think I just used a little bit of garlic in here. Oh, and yellow prepared mustard. It adds an essential color component and also a little bit of a tartness that I think you'll find enjoyable. And, of course, salt. Now, we're all a little bit over the board on salt if you're not supposed to use it. You know, I use, uh, of course, a nice mineral-rich salt, not the iodized version. It's just your body does better with the natural forms of sea salt or mineral-rich salt. So I advocate for putting those in your food. So with that said, I think I had those secret ingredients all right here. So I have my smoked paprika, my lemon juice. I think my little lemon's in here. And we're just going to dump this here into your little container. Now, how many at home, how many out here actually have a good blender or are comfortable using the blender? All right. You know, for me, for what I do, if I did not have a blender or a good food processor, it makes healthy eating all the much better. Now, for blenders, although they have this wonderful demonstration, I actually have a fantastic Blendtec. I love my Blendtec. I've had it for many years now, and I must say it's the best piece of equipment you could ever get. Once again, it's not a commercial. It's just my personal testimony because 
I use it, I don't know how many times each week. So it's more than recouped uh, the cost and savings. Also, what the blend deck does, I don't know, I need a lid. I can't turn this on for you folks yet. May, uh, I need a lid for the blender, please. Uh, the blend tech doesn't have the stir stick, but whatever. That's just a little editorial on the side. So as soon as I get that lid, we're just going to blend this thing right up. Thank you. Thank you. So let's see how it goes. Oh, joy. Let's see. How do I know if it's tight? I think that's... Is it, Where is it? There? Is that fine? <laughs> well, I would just go up in the mirror and sorry for the people in the front row. All right. Let's just, <laughs> even though this isn't a Gallagher show with watermelon, well, it may seem to turn into something uh, epic I like that. So I'm just going to see what goes on here. Well, it's not acting as my blend tech would. So I'll just have to add a little bit more water to ensure everything's blended up. I know I could have added it while it was working, but I did it this way. I guess this is a pause. that's good enough for the purposes of the demonstration. I, it's typically, like I said, at home, I just throw it all in, doesn't matter which, which way I throw it in, I just push the button and it blends it. And I love it for that because I'm in and out of the kitchen. So with that said, I think we have our sauce of which you folks already tasted on top of the party polenta squares. So let's see, so you have this beautiful, thick sauce, which can be refrigerated, you use this with Whatever you would like. Anyone have any suggestions on how they would use the sauce after tasting it? Vegetables, grains. Vegetables, grains, potatoes. One thing I like about this sauce is because you can't buy this sauce, right? It's not available. But it's actually fundamental to fall cooking and healthy cooking. So you should be able to pour it. Now, as I think I believe I mentioned in your article, or in the handouts there, this is actually a sauce that you can serve, as I said, either with beans, greens, or grains. But also, what you can do is freeze it for later use. And then if you have it on hand, you're more likely not to uh, rely on other products that you may not be so pleased with. So there you go. It's just already thick. You, I could have added more water, but there it is. And if you were to use merely, uh, I don't know, uh, more broth or keep it thick like this, it doesn't really matter because they both end up tasting good. Does anyone have any questions on the sauce? Yeah. yeah. I think she had her hand up first. Yes. Um, I came late, so I apologize for that. Uh -huh. But two questions. Um, the cashew butter, I, I missed uh, how you would make that. And when you say prepared vegetables or prepared pumpkin, does that mean already cooked? It does. Okay. And on the, on, what was your first question? Yeah, you can either use, it's, it's similar to a peanut butter or a almond butter, but you can buy it. Or if you don't have it, just use cashews, whole cashews, right? You're, you're fine with that. Yes? I just had a comment on the nutritional yeast. Yes, please. Um, they serve it a lot now in movie theaters. They do? Yeah. Yeah. I never go, so how would I know? Thank you. I am excited about that prospect. Why not? It's really good. I love it. Otherwise, you have to sneak it in, right? <laughs> Did anyone else have any questions? Oh, yes. They are a droop. So it's a type of fruit. It grows on the tree. Are people, anyone here familiar with how cashews grow? So it's, it's I don't know about baseball size, maybe? I don't, some, it's a fruit. So you got to peel it off the outer stuff, which is poisonous. 
And then you get to the luscious little cashews, which are around, I think, another seed. And that's where you have your cashew fruit. But that's why I think why um, it tastes so delicious, right? Because it has a rich quality to it that other tree nuts do not have. So one thing I enjoy about using cashews, you can use a little bit, goes a long way, and it will thicken up and add a certain creaminess to your dish, which is very, I don't know, people find it delicious. So that's just a way to do it. Did and I answer? Yes. Smoke yes. It's just, I researched this because a lot of people have questions. I used to think, what? This is actually where the smoke is, they burn the wood. It's smoked in like a specially prepared or manufactured facility. The smoke accumulates on the walls or on the partitions and they merely scrape off that smoke that has dried and place it in a product bottle like this. So a little bit goes a long way. However, if you are a kitchen uh, gadget admirer, I do advocate for getting one, something called a smoking gun, which sounds, who knows, anyone familiar with a smoking gun? Well, the smoking gun, as a little aside, it, the reason I, advocate, I say the smoking gun because it issues, it uses a cool, health-supporting smoke. It's a little machine that has an electronic ignition, and there's a piece of tubing apparatus. You would place your product in here in this blender, for instance, and then you would add the little smoking gun. The smoke would go in, infuse this whole product within five to ten, whatever minutes. They use it for fancy beverages or for vegetables, even for salads. You can have a nice smoke-infused, for example, spinach salad, which is delicious. And sometimes I use it for the Wednesday night dinners, too, just to add a little different nuance of flavor. Because you can use cherry wood or apple wood or hickory or mesquite wood. So those are all beneficial flavors of wood you want to have in some of these products. And so that's why I like to add a little bit of this. It adds a delicious nuance. So with that said, oh, yes. Um, when you cook your squash and you slow cook it, do you add any water to that? No, I don't. That's what I love about it. See, maybe it's because I'm a little bit lazy and I'm human and I don't like to spend a whole lot of time in the kitchen. But I just like to keep it simple, I think, as it is intended, as I see it. So I merely wash the squash, place it in a slow cooker, and then surprise, when you open up that slow cooker, when that squash is ready to eat, you'll actually see there's some liquid accumulated because it's a pretty high moisture content food. And you can also use that liquid back into your dishes here. So you'd be surprised. Moisture comes out of everything, right? Potatoes, carrots, there's always some moisture remaining in that slow cooker. Was there anyone else? Yes. I like to cook things slow and low as possible. That's just kind of how I move and operate through life, just slow and low, and nobody's going to get hurt. You can do it on high, but sometimes there'll be some caramelization or more browning, which isn't necessarily health supporting for us. That's why I prefer using a slow cooker as opposed to an oven. It's going to reduce those levels of the browning and potentially carcinogenic effects that come from that browning of the product. So, I just like to keep it slow and low. Anybody else? Otherwise, we're going to the best part with no, um, I'm sorry, what? Oh. <laughs> the best part is dessert. Why not? You know, I'm calling this dish a satisfying seasonal sweet treat. <coughs> Yumminess. Now, I know that sounds vague, like what? Patricia, couldn't you have done better than that? Well, maybe I could have, but... This is a three-in-one dessert, people. Three-in-one dessert. I'm not, I'm talking this dessert coming up can either be served as a mousse, as we're going to eat and enjoy today, or as a truffle, or it can be baked as a flourless, gluten-free dessert. Yumminess. So what do I say here? I'm actually going to uh, require this blender container to either be rinsed or to be, or I need another container if you have a second container. Thank you. I apologize for not letting you know earlier. But what am I talking about here? I'm actually going to use a kabocha squash. Are many of you familiar with the kabocha squash? Am I pronouncing it properly? I've heard it pronounced two different ways. 
But for my English tongue, it's usually kabocha, but I've also heard it pronounced as kaboka, I believe. So what it is is this little beautiful little squash here, this little baby squash. And what I've done for you here today is actually bring it to you here already prepared, already cooked. I wanted you to see how it looks cooked and how you can tell when it's cooked because it's a little soft, right? You see where you kind of feel, it feels soft. And also importantly, what I like the squash about is its flavor. You're soon going to tell how easy it is and how delicious it is to use in desserts. Now, the kabocha, as I've seen here and as I've read, how, you know, some people say, well, we want to eat for different reasons, but ultimately we want to eat for health, right? That's why we eat food. Sometimes we take it to other levels. Even though I'm using the knife here, you can see how easily that cuts. And the reason I'm demonstrating this to you is to see how easily you can remove the seeds at this stage of the game versus cutting it in half when it's raw, hard to cut. And also the seeds, you see here where the seeds are uh, embedded here, it also makes for easier removal of the seeds once the squash has been prepared, right? So you're not getting your hands all gummy, it's safer, and it's more nutritious prepared this way. So what I also neglected to mention is the seed part of squashes. You know what? If you're really industrious and feel like it, you would reserve all these seeds. You would just lightly dry them out in an oven. And then what you could do with your food processor is make your own nutritious seed blend sprinkle. You can buy that kind of stuff, but why buy it when you can make it yourself if you feel so inclined? You simply add your favorite seasoning, maybe some Bragg's liquid aminos. Thank you. And you can have your own powdered sprinkled topping that, once again, is seasonal and very nutritious since the seeds are the life-giving force of the vegetable. So going forward, we have now our kabocha squash that I've showed you about. Oh, and did I, I did, have I not mentioned? It's also fitting for a dessert. It's a bit of known as an aphrodisiac, right? So it has some of those components nutritionally that help, help, help with that in that area. So we have our prepared kabocha. I'm also saying you could use butternut because that's also another sweet type product squash. So we have... I believe I had already prepared some of the kabocha, so we won't be using this one. So I used my kabocha, put it in my blender, or did I say here a food processor? Why, of course, this is what we want to do is our food processor. Oh, different equipment, I don't know. We're just gonna dump it in through the top. And did you, you folks may know, this just is an interesting aside, that when they first designed the food processor, I'm thinking it was sometime in the early 1970s, it was a RoboCoop or RoboCoop from France. What unfortunately they did, and I guess this might be one of, you see how I can put my hand in here? Never ever do that. I shouldn't even be doing it now. Because I'm, always, I'm the type of person who will think there's gonna be some freak of nature and the electricity is just gonna go and maybe it's too many bad TV shows of watching. But never do that. And actually, now if you buy a, you know, nowadays you'd never be able to place your hand in there. I didn't realize that was going to happen with this particular machine. So I don't mean, I'm grateful for having this machine here. So we put our little, our little kabocha squash in there. Oh, and what do I say? Cocoa or carob? I prepare carob treats. Carob is naturally sweet. It's richer in micronutrients. It's ca naturally caffeine-free, very health-supporting, ancient, good food. And I live with a chocoholic. So I, I tend to run out of carob for Wednesday dinners, but I always have cocoa. This is a particularly good cocoa from Mill Valley, and it's naturally 99.7% caffeine-free. And what I think you will notice is when you taste your dessert, how delicious this cocoa is. I'm one of those people who happen to, I don't respond too well to cocoa or chocolates. It just makes me not feel good. But I tasted some of it, I think based on some of the components of the um, cocoa. But when I tasted this, it was well received by my body. So what do I say to put in here? A half cup each of cocoa powder. 
And what's this powdered peanut butter? Have any of you folks tried the powdered peanut butter? You might be, yes, no, maybe. Yeah, you know why? Why, why powdered peanut butter? Anyone want to tell me why? Powdered peanut butter. Why powdered peanut butter? Never heard of it? It's faster? It's true. It is. If for people um, concerned with weight management, this says 90% less fat than traditional peanut butter. One, the number one reason I also enjoy it is for stability. This is something like an emergency food product you would want to have in your emergency food preparedness box because this has a long shelf life because they've removed that fat component, which is the, the thing that's more likely to become rancid. So this product is also, since you're, you're dealing with a lot of the fat reduction, then you're left with a good protein part of the product if you're on special diet. This is something you can add to your smoothies for breakfast or supplement for your dinner. At last Wednesday night's dinner, we actually I had an Asian-inspired creamy chickpea dish, and we sprinkled some of this on top of the dish, and it just kind of added a different flavor. It was wonderful. So I yes. What I do with that? What? Is what? I mix it with uh, other kinds of ingredients, spices or whatever. Uh huh. Usually have it with me, and if I go out to eat a yes. salad, I yes. just ask for a little balsamic on the side and put the yeah. dry ingredients on and add the balsamic, and it's wonderful. Oh, that sounds good. Did all of you hear this? She she takes this peanut butter powder and with her out and adds it to her salad with the balsamic vinegar, and it's just wonderful. I can imagine it does because it doesn't have the overpowering flavor, but it does have the nuanced flavor of the peanuts. So what do I have here? I've already pre-measured my cocoa powder because I'm getting ready to run short on time here. I'm just going to speed it up for us a little bit. I have my cocoa powder in here and my powdered peanut butter. And then what am I going to add to that? Oh, what is this stuff? What did I do with it? I think I said I was going to use, and I did use, coconut butter because that's a more whole food product. I brought here today coconut oil. You really don't want to use this product unless this is probably what your kitchen has. This is a very popular product, so you probably have the oil. You can either um, melt, that at room, uh, melt that briefly on the, on the stove top, or you could use it whole if it's a warm day. It's kind of cool in here, so I don't think that's going to mix so well. But you'd want to add some of that coconut butter, but if you were pinched, coconut oil. And if people want to bring out the desserts, now would be a good time. And then what you want to add, but you know, I prepared this dish, and what I found is it really didn't require any sweetener. I was shocked. I don't know why, because the, perhaps it was the sweetness, natural sweetness of the kabocha squash or the cocoa, but it all made up for a luscious dessert. And if it's still not sweet enough, I, you can add some stevia, which I bring also, this just a few drops of this can do wonders for a dish, sweeten it, and it's not going to impact your blood sugar since it's an herb. Also, what I add, and I learned this from Chef Jillian Love, who does fantastic work, and she's coming up here in a few minutes. You'll want to maybe stay and watch for her because she does good stuff. She always advocates for adding just a wee bit, and this happens to be Brazilian sea salt, but advocating for using a wee bit of Brazilian or sea salt that helps bring out the natural sweetness without actually adding sugar. So I think I added, you could add some of what you're tasting. Are you folks tasting it? Mm -hmm. Isn't it surprisingly? That's just a wonderful surprise. It's actually a vegetable dish, I believe. And then what did I have in here? Hmm. Well, I, don't, I think we could go without, oh, I think some of this is, I added, this is some of the natural sweetener. You can use a coconut, you can use a coconut sugar too, which is a pretty well low glycemic, well received uh, product for your body. So you just want to add those if you like, dried fruit or not, can add other layers of richness. And as I said, I prepared for you a mousse form today that you can just easily taste and enjoy. Once again, you can prepare this product a week and ahead and enjoy it at any time. And if someone tells you there was squash in there, would you believe them? Does it taste like squash? Well, it just tastes good. Why not eat it with some cocoa, right? So if anyone, does anyone have any questions or comments on the product? Yes, ma'am. And this little baby kabocha, since I got home late last night after being here, 
And it was getting, I was wiped out. But I had, I was cooking my veggie corn dogs for special treats, right? So I had the oven on, so I placed it in the oven. But it's so tiny, it's a little baby of a squash. It's so tiny, it would have fit well in the slow cooker. The one that you're eating, um, I believe, was also roasted in the oven. Okay, so how long in the oven? About 325, 350 on parchment, depending, probably an hour. It depends on the size. It just depends on the size. Never, never. Just plunk it in there. Set it and forget. I know I love the slow cooker. Did anyone else have questions? Yes, ma'am. Or like a comment. I, me I mentioned it the last class because I'm really into using um, banana peels. You had to eat a really good quality banana. But the texture of it is just wonderful. And I would literally make that recipe and replace the oil with the banana. Peels. Well, thank you. That for Thank you. If those of you couldn't hear what she just said, she uses advocates for using banana peel, well washed, and it would it would, it would be a fantastic oil or fat replacer. She said she would make this recipe instead of using the coconut butter, use the banana peel. So that's another option. Did you have a question back there? I, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear you. Yes. It's the last one, the satisfying seasonal sweet treat. Did anyone? Did anyone else? Yes. That's a good question. I believe, as I understand it, you're using the entire banana peel. I know, as Westerners, we're not familiar with it, but I've, I haven't actually had any uh, experience with using that. But if you want to look it up, it seems to be a thing. Anybody else? I think we got to wrap it up. Uh, yes, Marlena. You know, you can find it at the biggest stores out there. Yes. I'm not going to give out any big corporate ugly names. But you can find it there. Where is that? Online, of course. Online, you can always find a better price. So if no one else has any questions, I want to thank you for coming out. Please come enjoy your recipes. Thank you. Thank you all. i got to scoot out of here because Chef Jillian's going to come in and stay for her because she always does a great job. <laughs>